Good morning, everybody. Good morning. We are about to begin. So if you could take your seats. So we have the first panel of the day. Pedagogy and Experimental Philosophy. In this panel, <clears throat> we have three presenters. And in order, the presenters are Jake Sherman, Matt Segal, and Joshua Remy. And so I will first be introducing Jake to you. I don't think he needs much of an introduction here, but for those who don't know him, uh, this. Jake Sherman is Chair of Philosophy, uh, Cosmology and Consciousness at CIIS. He received his PhD in Philosophical Theology from the University of Cambridge, taught previously at King's College London, and from 2014 to 17 held a visiting appointment at the universe, as a university lecturer in philosophy of religion at the University of Cambridge. By training a philosopher, theologian, and religious studies scholar, he is the author of Partakers of the Divine, Contemplation and the Practice of Philosophy, an editor with Jorge Ferrer of the Participatory Turn, Spirituality, Mysticism, Religious Studies. The author of over two dozen articles, essays, and re reviews, his writings have appeared in publications such as the Journal of American Academy of Religion, Modern Theology, and the International Journal of Philosophy and Theology. He is currently working on a new manuscript entitled The Book of Nature, Theology, Natural Philosophy, and the Ecological Imagination. And Jake is going to talk to us about pedagogy and the coming trauma of materialism, moving beyond 68 with Owen Barfield and Augusto Del Noche. Jake. Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, for my part this morning, I had trouble sort of exactly knowing how to uh, address these questions in light of 68, so I thought what I'd do is I'd go back and think about uh, some figures who were writing at that time who have been challenging to my own thought and to my own pedagogical practices. Uh, so I wanted to look at two extraordinary but regularly overlooked figures of the 1960s. Uh, the Italian philosopher and political theorist, Augusto Del Noce, and the literary critic, philosopher, and anthroposophist, and inkling, Owen Barfield. Both figures defy uh, easy categorization in terms of either left or right, uh, uh, in part because they, uh, they think that the, the sort of horizon against which left and right are defined is defined is precisely the horizon that they're interested in taking apart and moving beyond. Um, nevertheless, if you wanted to sort of think of them that way, you kind of think of Owen Barfield leaning very a little bit more towards the left with his interlocutors uh, in the 60s, especially being people like Norman L. Brown or Thomas J.J. Althusser uh, or Marshall McLuhan, while uh, Del Noche uh, swings a little bit more towards the right with his critique of totalitarianism coming largely from the kind of communio wing of Roman Catholicism. Okay, so. Um, already in the late 60s, Barfield and Del Noche diagnosed in their own day a kind of bourgeois transformation of both positivistic and historical materialism into what they discerned as a new reign of technology. Del Noche called it the affluent society, and Barfield refers to it simply as alienation, a society in which interiority is largely effaced, philosophy subjects itself to technology, and culture to politics. Both thinkers developed their response to this in part through reflecting on the student movements of the 1960s. 
in which they discerned a resistance to this affluent society, but a resistance that could not succeed without radical pedagogical attention not only to extant structures of oppression, but also, and even more, to the historical and metaphysical roots of modern alienation. So let me begin with some words about Owen Barfield, uh, for those of you who don't know his work. Although he spent the bulk of his adulthood working as a London solicitor in the mid to late 1960s and then on into the 1970s, Owen Barfield enjoyed a series of visiting appointments in universities across North America. Drew, Brandeis, SUNY, the universities of British Columbia, Victoria, and elsewhere. He spent the spring of 68, for example, as a visiting professor of philosophy at Hamilton College. And he made a number of journeys throughout the 60s and 70s to speak on American college campuses, including uh, just across the bay. He spoke at Cal, he spoke at UC Santa Cruz. Uh, in fact, during these visits, uh, Barfield often found the students far more receptive to his thinking than the faculty. Uh, during the height of the student protests in Berkeley, uh, when the students had effectively sort of taken over, uh, taken charge of curricular offerings, uh, they forced an offering for credit of in Barfield studies that ran for one semester. It was shut down after that, but. <laughs> now, while nearly all of Barfield's writings yield rich returns when studied, his most timely treatment in the 1960s is probably his essay titled The Coming Trauma of Materialism. If you've read any Barfield, you'll recognize a number of key themes here. He's concerned with the demythologization of nature and rampant attempts to reduce everything about everything to a combinatorial story in which anything real must be understood in terms of elementary particles and fundamental physical forces, both of which can be described mathematically and formally, rather than poetically and qualitatively. In The Coming Trauma, Barfield takes as his starting point the work of the historian Theodore Rossack, who's most famous for naming and chronicling uh, the making of the counterculture. Following and expanding upon Rossack's subsequent work, Barfield is interested in a deepening critique, not just of extant power structures and our ruthlessly technological societies, but rather in a critique of what he calls the historical and metaphysical roots from which these structures spring. At the heart of this is Barfield's critique of what he calls alienation. The psychological, cultural, political, and imaginative situation in which we find ourselves increasingly alienated from our primal experiences, our embodied experiences of reality. Alienation, he argues, proceeds in three phases. The alienation of the human being from nature, the alienation of human beings from their own bodies, and finally, the alienation of human beings from their own minds. Here's how he puts it in the essay. Quote, the vaunted progress of knowledge which has been going on since the 17th century has been progress in alienation. The alienation first of nature from humanity, which, which the exclusive pursuit of objectivity and science entails was the first stage. And it was followed with the acceptance of man himself, the human being, as part of nature so alienated, by the alienation of man from himself, says Barfield. The final and fatal step in reductionism occurred in two stages. First, his body and then his mind. Newton's approach to nature was already, by contrast with older scientific traditions, a form of behaviorism. And what has since followed has been its extension from astronomy and physics into physiology and ultimately into psychology. So here's what Barfield's saying. By reducing nature to a story of particles and their relations, and so removing from the world its dynamic, vital, and sold quality and meaning, we discover ourselves in a vast material machine subject either to mechanical or stochastic laws, rather than in a cosmos replete with inescapable meaning. But having discovered that we dwell in such a universe, we don't wait long until we discover that the body too is subject to these very modes of mechanical understanding, at which point the very life of the body becomes essentially unintelligible, and we begin to suspect that we ourselves are nothing but anticipatory corpses. Okay. Finally, we turn the analysis on the, onto the very consciousness doing the analyzing, and we dissolve our very selves into the pulverized bits of the universe to which we've reduced everything else. But having begun with an image of the real things of the world as so many vacuous actualities in extrinsic relations to one another, how are we to find our way back to mind or meaning or body? Within the alienated register of a certain modernity, there simply is no way out. But Barfield thinks we may be able to take, as Heidegger would put it, a step back through, the ex through a critical examination of the way in which we relate ourselves to accounts of the deep past. Now, generalizing rather broadly, Barfield thinks we can contrast our current mindscape, I don't like the term, he borrowed it from Rossack, 
Uh, we can contrast our current mindscape with the mindscape that prevailed for roughly 2,500 years, from, say, ancient Greek culture until the early scientific revolution. The pre-modern view, which differs radically among its adherents, nevertheless was largely marked by a common assumed intercommunion between the human being and nature, a nuptial relationship of mind and matter, or microcosm and macrocosm, that went beyond the mere passivity of sensation and the activity of manipulation. That world, that mindscape, comes to something like a cultural halt in the 17th or 18th centuries. Now, you can blame Descartes for that if you want, but he's probably more of a Richter scale than an earthquake, in my opinion. And the transformation had been prepared for in a number of ways, not least through the transformations wrought by late medieval nominalism and voluntarism, as Ivan Illich, Eric Allier, Charles Taylor, Catherine Pickstock, and others have persuasively argued. However it came about, by the end of the 18th and 19th century, the alienation of mind and matter, value and fact, interiority and exteriority, had become, as Barfield puts it, the subliminal reality principle of vast numbers of educated people in the West. Now, you might ask, does anyone really live this way? After all, people still pay attention to Mercury when it goes retrograde. They undergo Jungian <laughs> therapies. They worship, pray, read poetry, and spend money on the bizarre products that Gwyneth Paltrow hawks. They may do all of these and many other things that cut against the materialism of our age, but Barfield isn't interested in these sites of ideological skirmish, but rather in the persistence of alienation as a subliminal conviction. At the base of the largely hegemonic Western imagination, he argues, there is a mental habit that takes for granted, for all practical purposes, and for most theoretical ones, that the human psyche is intrinsically alienated from matter. In other words, Barfield compellingly shows how this unfolding alienation is inscribed into the changing shapes of our words themselves, and so inscribed into the very tools by which we might otherwise seek to think about or even resist this alienation. It thus presents itself as common sense or a reality principle. Feel free to believe whatever you like, but your imagination belongs to the forces of, of alienation. The sheer weight of this epical mental habit is discouraging, and it might seem as if resistance is futile. But observing the events of the 1960s, Barfield felt like he could see signs that the epoch of alienation might eventually, buck, eventually buckle under its own weight. He points, for example, to the creation of alternative communities, alternative pedagogical communities especially, communities and institutions that seek to base their common social life on assumptions at odds with the prevailing habits of alienation. CIIS, I think, is one such community, born out of the same cultural ferment. Barfield lists others, including the Human Potential <coughs> Movement, Back to the Land Movements, Friends of the Earth, Resurgence, Findhorn. He could easily have had, added Oroville, Shantivanam, and a host of others. There are also a number of other disciplines and practices that suggest the breakdown of alienation. Certain types of anti-Cartesian, anti-reductionistic psychotherapy, for example. Alternative healing practices from acupuncture to homeopathy. The accumulating evidence for parapsychological effects and the kind of Goethean science and other works carried on under the auspices of the anthropo anthroposophical movement all attract Barfield's attention. Here, too, he mentions the, the psychedelic renaissance of the 1960s, recently revived in our own time the discovery of Eastern spiritualities by the West, and the rediscovery of Western contemplative traditions, to say nothing of the reluctantly but inevitably anti-Cartesian tenor of quantum mechanics. Now, I'll, I'll try to return to Barfield if I have time at the end, but first I want to complicate his reading of the signs of the times by placing his account alongside that of the Italian political philosopher Augusto del Noce. Del Noce penned a number of essays responding directly to the student protests of the 1960s, protests that took place not only across North America and in Paris, but also, you might recall, in London, Berlin, and Del Noce's own Rome. Del Noce is sympathetic to the motives behind the student protests. The students, quote, restlessness and impatience, their mistrust of their elders, are in themselves positive phenomena. Indeed, they express human nature's rebellion against the distinctive process of desecration and dehumanization at the same time that characterized the dominant societal approaches of the day. Del Noce writes, they do not want to belong to this system as instruments, which incidentally would be unavoidable because the society of well-being knows only instruments. I'll say more about what Del Noce calls here the society of well-being in a moment. He also calls it the affluent or technological society and believes that together with Soviet-style Marxism, these compromise the dominant European and North American societal options of the mid-20th century. The students are right to refuse these options, he says, but he worries that the protests misdiagnosed their ailments. In the midst of this entirely justifiable resistance to what would become the most materially destructive organization of life in Earth's history, 
uh, the etiology of the affluent society was mistakenly identified with tradition, which leads students to redeploy precisely the very categories upon which the affluent society itself depends, namely the supposed contrast of tradition and progress, conservative and liberal, religion and science, or whatever iteration you like of the tendency to ascribe axiological value to modernity. This tendency is not new to the 20th century. Uh, you can look, you can find it in the past in, uh, in millenarian movements or Joachim de Fiore's spiritual Franciscanism. And you can see it redeployed with a special force in early enlightenment uh, notions of modernity, sort of as humanity having come of age, right? That's what he means by the ascribing axiological value to modernity. Simply being new, simply being what is now is taken to be a marker, an indication of uh, of success in terms of value. So, um, taken to its extreme, this enlightenment description of axiology to modernity entails the total reconstruction of culture. Uh, in, uh, in the 20th century, this, this tendency that was present already in our past reappeared with new force. I think in part because of the effects of the First and Second World War, which were taken as a kind of historical revelation. Right? Why is it that the sense of modernity's inherent value returns with such force, if not because something new had shown itself in the 20th century? The horrors of the 20th century were taken to be an unprecedented unveiling of the true nature of things. So taken to its extreme, you then begin to think that no matter what, whatever went before needs to be gotten rid of. What we need to do is just focus on building the new. This is, I think, the right way to understand Jack Weinberg's Don't Trust Anyone Over 30 from the 1960s. It's not that people who are 35 or 42 or whatever are inherently untrustworthy, but it's that they hadn't lived through, that it's that they had been formed and educated before the events of the middle of the 20th century. And so they couldn't understand the new as it was supposedly being unveiled. Now, both Del Noche and Barfield take history and its contingencies extremely seriously. But they both held that history cannot be taken seriously if it is absolutized in the way that modernity does. Only an equally historical and metaphysical approach allows us to understand the material events of history, recent or otherwise. As Del Noche put it in an early work, thinking in relation to the present historical context does not mean denying the eternity of metaphysical problems, but recognizing them in their true sense. Because it is necessary that we unburden metaphysical thought of the immobilization in formulas that makes it look makes it liable to look like the alienated image of a certain historical situation. Rather than following from a hidden rejection of eternity, the recognition of historical context is motivated by the need not to confuse eternity and time. So then how do we diagnose the transformations of the mid-20th century and perhaps? the transformations that we're still undergoing in our own day. Del Noche's most distinctive and controversial thesis is that the philosophical and spiritual contours of the affluent or technological society can be traced directly to what he calls the decomposition of Marxism. Barfield's account of alienation is remarkably similar to Del Noche's reading of the affluent society, but Barfield pays precious little attention to the political and institutional forms that implement and enforce these basically imaginative convictions about the nature of reality. Perhaps this is because Barfield was British, whereas Del Noce lived in closer proximity to both fascism and revolutionary Marxism in Italy of the mid 20th century. He could also see the affluent society emerging victorious, as it were, on the backs of both. 30 years before the fall of the Soviet Union and the apparent triumph of the neoliberal order, Del Noce could see it coming. Aristotle holds that we only understand something dynamic if we watch it as it comes into being and grows. So what did Del Noce see as the affluent society was coming into being? He sees this emergent order as related in some ways to a fundamental perversion or parodic expression of Marxism. Marxist revolutionary thought, he claims, effectively ended up being the occasion for the fulfillment of the bourgeois spirit in the so-called technological society. I use this expression here, I'm quoting Del Noche, I use this expression here to indicate a society characterized not by increasing scientific and technical activity, but rather by the concept of instrumental reason that is by the interpretation of all human activity in terms of technical activity. Still quoting Del Noche, I would like to propose the following definition. It is, the affluent society, is a society that accepts all of Marxism's negations against contemplative thought, religion, and metaphysics, that accepts, therefore, the Marxist reduction of ideas to instruments of production, that, on the other hand, rejects the revolutionary messianic aspects of Marxism, 
and thus what is still religious in the revolutionary idea. In this regard, it truly represents the bourgeois spirit in its pure state, the bourgeois spirit triumphant over its two traditional adversaries, transcendent religion and revolutionary thought. The affluent society, in other words, is not the result of progress, the progress of science and technology. It's not humanity come of age, but is instead a kind of de-romanticized Marxism, a quasi-Marxian philosophy that knows no real revolutionary hope and can permit no Walter Benjamins. Del Noche writes, the affluent society is the only one in the world, in world history, that does not originate from a religion, but rises essentially against religion, even if paradoxically this religion against which it rises is Marxism. The affluent society can also be described as the society of well-being, the culture of wellness or comfort. This is the first and primary characteristic of the affluent society, the replacement of transcendent or transpersonal ideals with deracinated and essentially conservative goal of pure comfort. The question isn't one primarily of prosperity or of its absence, but rather of the goal of society. Because it can, in principle, know no other goals, the affluent society effectively makes well-being the highest social and even moral goal. This yields a number of consequences, including, in the first place, the replacement of philosophy with practical uh, science in the quest for the good life. It isn't through moral deliberation, philosophical reflection, uh, and careful metaphysical speculation. It isn't through embodied pedagogies and the conversations we have with one another in quest of the good, the true, and the beautiful. Uh, that we discover the goal of life, but rather through computation, innovation, and design that we in the affluent and technological society hope to discover our heart's desire. The crucial point here is that the motive force in the emergence of the affluent society is not material, technological, or for that matter, epistemological. It's a moral revolution, the kind to which Nietzsche taught us to pay attention. As philosophers will know, for all of its appeal to science, scientism is finally incoherent insofar as its epistemological standards cannot be secured according to their own procedures. Science cannot tell us that science itself enjoys special or exclusive purchase on the real, which means that any commitment to scientism can only be based on a resolution of the will, which is to say a moral resolution, the resolution to accept as real only that which can be verified empirically by everyone. A couple, a couple quick last points. Uh, this scientism, this elevation of science to the absolute model of knowledge, effectively elides human, human interiority, something that both Barfield and Del Noche saw being played out in the revolutions of the 1960s. Moving more quickly, in the third place, absolute scientism entails an absolute secularity, or the end of religions, or more specifically, the elimination not of religions, but of what Del Noche calls the religious dimension of human experience the presence of and desire for the divine that is operative in homo religiosus, as, Mer as Mercia Eliada named us, the dimension that manifests precisely in the concern for meaning, purpose, and so forth, that scientism treats as nonsensical because it falls outside of its canons of verifiability, all of which provides the conditions for the fourth characteristic of the affluent society, namely the totalitarianism of the society of well-being, in which culture is made entirely subordinate to politics, the culture that must be made subordinate to politics is summed up by Del Noche under the moniker Platonism, which he takes to be as a, short, a shorthand for the experience of religious transcendence and contemplative reason. The new totalitarianism, by contrast, describes a world of radical anti-Platonism in which neither transcendence nor contemplation nor the dimension of ideal and symbolic value have any place. A world conceived instead as a system of forces and not of values. As Del Noche's translator Carlo Lancelotti puts it, rejection of transcendence has the effect that all human realities, the state, sexuality, work, the family, lose their symbolic or ideal significance and become dumb, completely devoid of any finality beyond the satisfaction of, the material, of immediate material or psychological needs that can be studied empirically. The common sense assumption that totalitarian threats of the 20th century have passed is a dangerous illusion. Totalitarianism has evolved but precisely evolved so that it can seem to disappear. The essence of totalitarianism, thinks Del Noche, reflecting especially on his experience of such regimes during his youth, lies in the negation of the universality of reason so that any form of opposition to established power supposedly does not express rational concerns, but merely conceals the interest of class according to communism or race according to Nazism. Totalitarian systems, in other words, effectively monopolize power by claiming that rationality is always already ineluctably political, thereby ensuring that any criticism can be dismissed a priori as merely ideological. As a consequence, in a kind of perverse communicatio idiomatum, not only is reason politicized, 
but politics is absolutized. Everything cultural must become political. And the idea and the idea of politics is subsumed within the idea of war. Um, I've pretty much come to the end of my time, so I'll just close with a couple sentences on the pedagogical implications of this. Uh, both Del Noche and Barfield think that the problem uh, lying at the root of the emergence of the culture of alienation, the culture of affluence, the technological society, is a problem that has to do with the loss of the human spirit, the loss of our capacity to believe our own inclinations and to follow our own inclinations, to ask meaningful questions, not only about my end individually, but about the end of all things, the end of our societies, the end of material well-being, the end of the earth. Having foreclosed, those, having foreclosed the very categories, the very tools by which we might ask those questions, we find ourselves uh, necessarily interpolated by a materialistic society of consumption and commodification, one that hides the very fact that we've been so interpolated by using soft power rather than the coercive uh, strong power of the totalitarian governments of the mid-20th uh, mid century. What might be the effects of a radical, what might sort of resistance of a radical pedagogy, uh, or what kind of resistant radical pedagogies might we imagine in order to uh, transform and aerate that system, in order to allow that system, as Barfield put it, to begin to buckle under the weight of its own contradictions? I think, I hope that we'll have a conversation about some of those pedagogies, and I hope it's something that we've been trying to accomplish here at this institute and in this building by bringing not only the mind, but the entirety of the human soul, body, mind, spirit, desire, imagination, into inquiries about the things that ultimately matter and that ultimately orient the highest of our loves. Thanks for your attention. Thank you, Jay. Very nice and stimulating talk. And we'll move on now to Matt, Matt Segal. Matt Segal is a process philosopher who teaches courses on process relational thought and German idealism for the philosophy, cosmology, and consciousness program at CIIS. In the spring, 2000, in the spring 2018 semester, he taught a course called Process and Difference in the Pluriverse which applied process relational metaphysics to the present social, political, and ecological crisis. He has published widely, and his most recent book is titled Physics of the Word Soul, The Relevance of Alfred White North, uh, North Whitehead's Philosophy of Organism to Contemporary Scientific Cosmology. He blogs regularly at footnotes to Plato.com. <laughs> Thank you, Dave Ashish, and thank you, Jake, for going first. It's nice to hear some resonances in what I want to say, so I'm really looking forward to the conversation after. Um, so my paper is called From Final Knowledge to Infinite Learning, with help from Whitehead and Gilles Deleuze. A few brief remarks um, to preface what I want to present here. I like to think Whitehead through Deleuze, um, not only because they're both process thinkers, but because Whitehead was writing um, a century ago. There's a bit of colonial residue in a lot of his, his books, where he'll sometimes unironically refer to savages and things like this. Um, I think the spirit of his thought is certainly redeemable in a contemporary context. but. Um, I think Deleuze helps with some of these problems in Whitehead's thought. But on the other hand, Deleuze can also sometimes be a thinker who um, kind of, I would say, likes to go skinny dipping in the rivers of hell and just embraces chaos without any clear, um, anything salvageable that can be easily communicated to we mere mortals. Whitehead, I think, helps to um, bring him in a bit and um, Give ex even though Whitehead's not easy to read either, to give expression to some of these deep ideas in a way that is relevant to the sciences, that's relevant to um, humanities, that's relevant to education. Whitehead was, along with being a physicist, a mathematician, a philosopher, and metaphysician, he was um, an educator and lectured widely about pedagogy. 
Okay. So California Institute of Integral Studies was founded in 1968 by the integral philosopher Haridas Chaudhary. Dr. Chaudhary's integral vision will function for me today as an invitation to re-envision education as an ongoing process whereby the human and the cosmos are brought into ever more intimate contact with one another. In Chaudhary's words, I quote, the more we understand the essential structure of the universe as a whole, the more we gain insight into the structure of humanity. The obverse is also true. The more we understand the essential structure of the human, the more we gain insight into the unfathomable mystery of being. It's from his book, The Evolution of the Integral Consciousness. For the purposes of our panel on experimental philosophy and pedagogy, I will interpret Dr. Chaudhary's insight in the following way. As integral philosophers, we must match our evolutionary cosmology with an evolutionary epistemology. And as integral educators, we must ground our epistemology in pedagogy. This raises a series of questions that I will try to untangle in my talk. If we, if we claim to know something as philosophers, how is it that we came to know it? And how are we to share and review this knowledge and our method of arriving at it with our colleagues and with students? And as spiritual practitioners embedded in learning communities, how do we adapt our educational activities and our theory of learning to the fact of an ensouled, evolving cosmos? And finally, what is the purpose of the university in an, evolu in an evolutionary universe like ours? In accepting Dr. Chowdhury's invitation to re-envision education in more integral terms, I'm turning for help to the philosophies of education of two other 20th century thinkers, Whitehead and Deleuze. In what follows, I will summarize each of their perspectives and attempted answers to these questions that I've raised. So almost 30 years ago, uh, Deleuze described the transition from a disciplinary society where individuals were ruled by environments of enclosure, such as factories, hospitals, schools, prisons, and so on, to what he called a control society where power is no longer localized in institutions, but distributed across networks. We now have more access to information than ever before, but our every move is tracked by increasingly invasive surveillance technology. So we are surrounded by screens whose media content is tailored specifically to our desires. Pop-up ads appear on our smartphones before we even become conscious of our desire for the product being sold to us. So in a sense, even our desire is being constructed and shaped by these technologies. We are no longer free individuals, but nodes in vast corporate-owned relational databases. Questions of the fragility of human freedom and of liberal democracy itself have come to the fore. For example, in a recent op-ed in The Guardian, the Israeli historian Yuval Noah Harari argues that in this new context, the idea of liberal freedom the foundation of the modern West's political and educational institutions is essentially make-believe uh, and must be discarded. What we put in its place is not entirely clear. If the individual freedom imagined by liberalism has become an impossible fiction, how might we reimagine our human potentials in the context of a new, more networked environment? How are educators to respond to this situation? Now, Whitehead articulated his pedagogical theory a century ago when the coming collapse of disciplinary society was not yet fully apparent. Universities remained among the most powerful and important institutions in the world, a source of great hope for the future of the species. Times have changed, but his ideas for reforming education, which, as we will see, cannot be separated from his ideas for reforming metaphysics and cosmology, remain as relevant as ever. While at Harvard, Whitehead witnessed the founding of one of America's first business schools. He suggested at the time that a great function awaiting American universities was to civilize business by cultivating socially constructive motives in business students. This, he hoped, would shape their motives such that the amassing of fortunes would be pursued not as an end in itself, but as a means to the betterment of humankind. Things have not panned out as he'd hoped. 
Uh, as Deleuze put it in his essay on the rise of control societies, today's schools have been delivered over to corporations to serve as perpetual training facilities. Their sole purpose is now to prepare children to join the workforce. In our historical moment, Whitehead's pedagogical theory serves as an act of resistance against the corporate takeover of education. His theory is motivated by two related premises. First, students are alive. Second, the purpose of education is to stimulate and guide their self-development. And these seem like obvious things to say. Students are alive. <coughs> but in especially the industrial era in which we live and even in the control society, that can't be taken for granted. We are living organisms, right? With interior desires and purposes and goals, and we grow and develop. So such development would naturally feed the growth of the species as a whole, but not only that. For Whitehead, social construction is not just a human activity. It is the aim of the universe, which is to say that it functions at all levels, physical, biological, psychological, even theological, to further the evolutionary adventure of cosmogenesis. Education works on our motives. It builds our values. It is not just about memorizing rules, facts, and figures. And certainly, it is not just about job training. It is about intensifying our capacity to consciously participate in the realization of truth, of goodness, and of beauty. Whitehead's theory of education is a protest against dead knowledge and inert ideas. Inert ideas are those which are merely received into the mind without having been tested, utilized, or brought into fresh combination. Education in inert ideas is not only useless, it is harmful. It assumes that the human mind is a dead instrument, just awaiting information an assumption that ends up forming dead minds. Learning often requires rigor, but should never become a chore. Learning is intrinsically enjoyable, Whitehead says, because the general ideas that it can engender within us can bring us understanding of that stream of events which pours through our life, which is our life. There is only one subject matter for education, Whitehead writes, and that is life in all its manifestations. Whitehead describes education as a recurring cycle of first uh, romantic allurement, then precise specialization, and finally free, gen free generalization. And then the cycle begins again. He says, quote, we should banish the idea of a mythical far off end of education. Education is not only a lifelong, but an infinite task. In Whitehead's universe, if there is to be any immortality, any transcendence, you might say, it is only through profound education that we might become adequate to it. There is no final system to memorize because we do not inhabit a finished cosmos. Ours is a cosmogenesis. Whitehead's novel Process Relational Ontology, his ensouled cosmology, and his imaginative pedagogical theory all arose together out of the revolutions in 20th century mathematics and physics. The material world is not determined by eternal laws in Whitehead's cosmology. The fact of the matter is that matter is an act, which is not to say that matter is an illusion. Rather, matter in Whitehead's cosmology is the result of an ongoing expressive activity. Here it becomes clear that Whitehead's theory of education cannot be separated from his process relational ontology. He's no idealist or social constructionist, as this term is usually understood. For him, construction is a cosmological activity rooted in a creative principle that precedes human beings and that we participate in. It follows that education is a cosmic activity, something the universe is doing through us, and simultaneously something that we as conscious beings are doing to the universe. As the romantic philosopher, poet Novalis put it, our vocation is the education of the earth. There's no end to education, it is an infinite task, Whitehead thus believed that education should coincide with the cultivation of a reverence for the eternal present. He, he says, the present contains all that there is. It is holy ground, for it is the past, and it is the future. He says, the foundation of reverence is this perception that the present holds within itself 
the complete sum of existence, backwards and forwards, the whole amplitude of time, which is eternity. So turning to Deleuze now, in 1968, he published Difference and Repetition, a text that attempts to transform Immanuel Kant's transcendental method, which had claimed to provide a priori knowledge of the general form of all possible experience, into an initiatory approach to open-ended learning and concept creation that is responsive to actual occasions of experience. It is from learning, Deleuze tells us, not from knowledge that the transcendental conditions of thought must be drawn. Deleuze continues, now writing with his frequent co-author, uh, Felix Guattari, when something occurs, the self that awaited it is already dead, or the one that would await it has not yet arrived. There is thus, according to Deleuze, something both fatal and amorous about the learning process. Education can be both destructive and productive of our subjectivity. We are not the same subject before and after an occasion of learning. Learning is thus transformative. Learning is more than mere imitation as well. It's more than a pre-established subject's attempt to mirror a prefabricated knowledge. Imitation can be helpful in a secondary corrective way, Deleuze tells us, but only after the learning process has already been initiated. How precisely this initiation occurs is difficult to spell out. Deleuze suggests that learning is instigated semiotically by way of an encounter with signs. Learning is the interpretation of and response to signs, where the response does not resemble the sign, but rather actively unfolds what is enveloped within it. We learn through differential repetition and not reproduction of the same, since each new encounter with a sign invokes a novel conceptual constellation in the learner, aiming to unfold whatever the sign is unfolding. Deleuze gives the example of learning to swim. He writes, the movements of the swimming instructor which we reproduce on the sand bear no relation to the movements of the wave, which we learn to deal with only by grasping the former in practice as signs. So learning is thus as much a practical sensory motor task as it is an intellectual or theoretical one. We learn only by transforming ourselves, body and soul. In learning, we are always becoming something else. Our faculties are pushed beyond their limits and forced to overcome themselves, synesthetically spilling into and out of one another. Thinking conceives of problems whose solutions can only be kinesthetically enacted, for example, learning to swim. Just as sensation presents problems whose solutions can only be thought, for example, a child's first encounter with a mirror. Thoughts become sensible, sensations become thinkable. Thus Deleuze tells us, I quote, learning always takes place in and through the unconscious, thereby establishing the bond of a profound complicity between nature and mind. I'm gonna skip ahead a bit so we can get to Joshua. Um, so Deleuze laments the way that the Western philosophical tradition has tended to subordinate the learning process to the product of knowledge, uh, such that learning is treated as a mere, inter a mere intermediary, leading from ignorance to wisdom. The learner is likened to a rat in a maze where the end goal is predetermined rather than needing to be uh, invented anew in each pedagogical participant's encounter with a problem. He gives the example of Hegel, who, um, despite the way his famous text, The Phenomenology of Spirit, recounts an extraordinary apprenticeship um, and a learning process, it nonetheless ends up subordinating this process to the final end product of absolute knowledge. So what is education becoming in today's networked control society? What is the role of the university in our increasingly imperiled planetary civilization? These are huge questions that I cannot pretend to have answered. If universities are going to be vaporized into virtual campuses, can so-called online education successfully enact the integral pedagogical approach briefly explored here? I don't know, but there are at least some positive signs. Universities have long been driven by the desire to preserve and pass on the flame of knowledge won by past luminaries. This remains a noble and important responsibility, but perhaps today, our most urgent task as university educators is to inspire hope by imagining and working to build futures worth living in. However, in so doing, we must also cultivate a reverence for the present, for the eternal moment, 
for we can never leave this moment as if to inhabit some past golden age or some future utopia. Integral philosophers like Chaudhary, Whitehead, and Deleuze invite us to inhabit the profound and generative mystery of the learning process here and now. Everywhere and always, learning remains an infinite task. Integral education is a lifelong practice of participation in the creative energy of the cosmos. There is no final exam, though as Deleuze as well as Socrates and Plato knew, part of this participation is also learning to die. If education is preparation for anything, we can only say that it, it, that it is a preparation for death. And the best way to prepare to die is to discover the best way of living well. This is the end that education should serve. The search for final knowledge becomes a practice of infinite learning when knowing is placed back in the context of the eternal cosmic cycle of life and death. The human mind is not an instrument to be sharpened, a wax tablet to be informed, or a birdcage to be tamed. Each mind is rather a unique living personality seeking creative expression. In the education, sorry, in the evolution of life, um, we're fundamentally witnessing a process of learning. It is, this evolutionary process is creative rhythm, <coughs> differential repetition, fractal reproduction. Life is thus in sync with death, as death beats bodies into form, generating by eliminating what does not serve the growth of life as a whole. Learning is thus the heart of all life. Thank you, man. Another very uh, beautiful and stimulating talk. Thank you. So we move on now to Joshua Ramey. Uh, Joshua is visiting assistant professor in interdisciplinary program in peace, justice, and human rights at Haverford College. Ramey holds a PhD in philosophy from Villanova University, and his research is in political economy, critical theory, and the philosophy of religion. He is the author of The Hermetic Deleuze, Philosophy and Spiritual Ordeal, and, and Politics of Divination, Neoliberal Endgame, and the Religion of Contingency. So I'll turn it over to Josh. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you to Josh and uh, Matt and uh, Jacob. It's really good to be with both of you again. Um, be back at CIS. I was here about five years ago at Jacob's invitation when I was um, starting to work through some of the ideas that um, became uh, the yeah the, the neoliberalism book on on, on markets had uh, divinatory uh, devices, false ones, bad ones, um, but nevertheless. Um, uh, so it's good to, good to be back here uh, again and. Um, Still talking about capitalism, sorry. Um, uh, but uh, in a more specific way, actually, today, what I want to talk about is capitalism as a form of war and, and warfare, um, which picks up directly on, um, I'm not sure who Barfield or, or um, yeah, you'll know, the idea of politics is basically war and this assumption of culture into politics being tantamount to war. Um, uh, so I want to talk a little bit about that and then uh, also about dying and, and pedagogy for death. So um, I, I, I'm the gothic presentation today. It's war and death. Um, um, so uh, I, and I'm not, I don't really want to apologize for that because it's, it's, uh, it's very important. I, I, I don't think that I know very well how to um, learn to be at war or, or to learn how to die. I, I think it, it maybe is the greatest challenge um, for all of us. Um, but it, the, for me, at, at this moment, um, uh, this is the edge for me, how, how, how to learn how to be at, at war, uh, which is not the same thing at all as how to be violent. Um, and then also uh, how to die, which is also not moribund. Uh, it, it's gothy, but it's not more about it. Uh, so uh, uh, that's what I want to talk about. Um, and so the first half of the talk is going to be about why I think it's very 
helpful and important actually for us to understand that capitalism um, has become over the course of the 20th century, especially since 68, uh, uh, what Deleuze calls a war machine. And that economics is basically war by, by any and all means necessary, which some of you may uh, pick up on being a reversal of Clausewitz's formula um, that you know, war is the extension of politics by other means. Um, uh, I think what we're living in is, is economics as war by any and all means. That's, that's what capitalism has effectively become. And I think that really got going uh, after 68 and after the failures of the, the insurrectionary movements um, to sustain themselves, uh, which I don't have a theory about, but um, I think it's very interesting given some of the talks yesterday. I mean, it's, it's, I, I, I don't want to say at all that, that you know, this, that we should despair over the legacy of 68. I think that it's very powerful and it's, it's still animating everything from, you know, the Indiana movement and the Nuit Dubu Occupy, Standing Rock. Um, but there's new, there's obviously new challenges and um, those challenges are, 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 I think in particular, the ones that I'm addressing myself to uh, around this the idea of being at war, which I think we need to get more familiar with and also, um, what it means to, to die or to, to die creatively. So I'll start with a couple of um, uh, quotations. One's from Jesus of Nazareth uh, in the Gospel of Matthew. Think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. Uh, second uh, is a quotation from the uh, uh, Guatemalan uh, shaman uh, Martin Prechtel. Violence is the absence of conflict. Violence is the absence of conflict. And the uh, third uh, quotation I want to start with is from uh, Eric Allier and Maurizio Lazzarato's uh, recent book, uh, Wars and Capital. Um, emerging victorious from the confrontation with the movement and thought of 68, uh, the neoliberal war machine has continued to win victory after victory. These victories come with an erasure of the memory of wars, of civil wars, of the wars of class, race, gender, and subjectivity from which the victors gain their domination. He's talking there, of course, about the you know, ongoing struggles for racial justice, gender, gender equity, um, so on. Uh, the neoliberal eraser, the ne neoliberalism erases our, continuously erases our memory of the struggles and, and makes us think that we're not actually in them or that they're impossible. Walter Benjamin reminds us that reactivating memory and reality of wars and civil wars can only come from the defeated. The fact that the defeated of 68 were unable to see, describe, counteract the transformation of the war and social wars imposed by the enemy demonstrates the weakness of critical theory and represents one of the reasons for the disappearance of revolutionary political war into its inability to divide war and multiply confrontations that create could create new war machines. This is that's a long-winded way of saying we have to renew the struggle. And the struggle is going to look, look very different today than it did in, in 68. You know, I was at Standing Rock. I think that's a, there's an arrow ahead there, but you know we can talk about this kind of thing. Uh, a little, just a little bit more from them before I, I start my remarks. Sixty-eight thought did not show itself capable of producing a strategic knowledge adequate to the civil wars capital was able to restart as an overall response to its global destabilization, which reached its climax in sixty-eight. I'll say a little bit about the economic history of that in a minute. Uh, as proof, if needed. It is not enough to state that micropolitics has to pass into macropolitics to transform it, even though this is often uh, forgotten. Uh, both micro and macro politics have to be included in the multiplicity of wars that take place there, without which both micro and macro politics collapse, and the struggles occurring there lose their consistency in the becoming minor of not many people. Uh, make the one you are fleeing flee, said Deleuze and Guattari when distinguishing the schizo and the revolutionary. 
and last remark, the, the essential limit of 68 thought is inability to think of war in all its components as, as total form of value creation of capital, relegating its reformist moment to strategic parentheses in the grand capitalist utopia of their free market. According to Eric Allier and Mauricio Lazzarato, the failure of 68 thought is a failure to maintain the adversarial edge of the coalitions between minorities, what they would call the becoming minor of many that was happening at the time, as blacks, women, gays, and lesbians, students, workers, and others were becoming minor together. The failure then is that we have turned on one another in the endless turnings of identity politics and in the futile attempt to win the culture wars. We have failed to maintain a massive minor front that we can fight in and through together. We have failed to remain at war. To make those we are fleeing flee, we must become minor together. Minor, of course, does not here mean minority, since the vast majority of the human population consists in these so-called minorities, those of color, children, women, the disabled, veterans, the homeless, the enslaved, the traffic, the exiled, and the refugee. Here comes everybody, minor together. In some sense, we failed because the demand of 68 was in fact met. Another world was made possible, at least for a privileged few. The demand for creative free self-expression and the exploration of higher consciousness was met if you were white or could pass for it. The demand for meaningful life was tolerated, at least for white middle class people and their token black, brown, and queer hangers on in exchange for the acceptance of global capitalism as the form of world peace. But as many of us have woken up to since the financial crisis of 2008, this supposed peace is actually war. War on the planet, war on our psyches, war among us all. This is what Allier and Lacerado call total civil war. It is peace bought at the price of ruthless competition between every differentiation of the laboring classes, race, gender, nationality, ability, and every other micro differentiation weaponized against us as it's quantified, uh, packaged, and speculated on in the form of financial derivatives. I was born in 1975 at the end of the insurrection, the beginning of the rise of the neoliberal state terror apparatus known as the unlimited market, for which the conservative Christian version of Northern California libertarianism I grew up in was a sometimes unwitting and often willing accomplice. I was radicalized by the crash of 2008, by the implosion of the academic job market, by Standing Rock, uh, and with Occupy in between. But before that, in grad school, I was a child of 68 theory, and I still think it's a vision of 68 to which we must return and repeat differently. And that's what my title's about in the program, intensifying the contradiction. Uh, uh, that's what I want to, I'm asking us to return to. Here I am, here we are. I, 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 did, I came of age in the radically depoliticized 90s and noughts, and for a while, I thought I could meditate and do enough psychedelics and participate in evolutionary consciousness and ignore the vulgarity of Clinton and the stupidities of Bush. But now I know that consciousness is not enough. It's not nothing. In fact, it's essential for the struggle, supported by places like this one, like Oroville uh, and others. But consciousness is not enough. It's necessary, but it's not sufficient. There's also the struggle. If Allier and Lazzarato are right, the failure of 68 was not the failure to bring in world peace. It was a failure to sustain the struggle, the war. We have to return to the fundamental contradictions in the post-68 settlement, the contradiction between creative free self-expression and consciousness exploration on the one hand, and the capitalist conditions for life and death on the other. The contradiction between the individual healing on the one hand and collective and terrestrial struggle against the capitalist war machine on the other. My only suggestion, really, my only thought today, is that we must not resolve, but intensify this contradiction. We must renounce the trade-off of tokenism and the politics of recognition, and return <clears throat> to trans individuality and the politics of collective struggle. And again, I think there are many signs that we're already doing this and, and trying to do it, but we're obviously trying to do it in an extremely imperiled and exhausted moment, which is what I want to come to right in a minute how we deal with our exhaustion. We must refuse the betrayal of desire by pleasure, the betrayal of knowledge by information, the betrayal of war by peace. We have to learn to be at war together again, to take up the call of Christ, 
bring peace, not a sword. I'm sorry, not peace, but a sword. And to take up, see, I can't even say it, Lord. That's, <laughs> that's how far gone we are. Um, to, bring, <laughs> to bring not peace, but a sword. Um, and by the way, it's a, it's a good day for swords because it's the feast of St. Michael and all angels. So, you know, get out, get out your sword. Um, uh, uh, to bring peace, uh, not peace, but a sword. And to take up the challenge of the Guatemalan shaman Martin Prechtel that violence is the absence of conflict. We must re-engage in conflict in order to stop the violence of the total civil war of capitalist peace. Uh, and, and partly what's at stake here is that we haven't, we have never fully understood the enemy since 68, and maybe maybe we're starting to, that's what we're waking up to. Let me give a quick uh, analysis here of why we should call economics war at this point, and then I'll turn to uh, Vanessa Andriotti's work on how to educate ourselves in this situation. Uh, as I mentioned before, Clausewitz's famous formula was that war is the continuation of politics by other means. And this formula, of course, reflects a different political situation, that of the early modern nation state, the sort of Walrasian settlement. Um, Clausewitz's basic idea was that the nation state doesn't really want to be at war, but it desires, uh, it only really desires to do this to protect its interests, and will go to war when those are threatened. Um, and, and thus, uh, even when the protection of state interests do extend to warfare, this is only for the sake of returning as quickly as possible to the, the peace of, of a detente. But according to Deleuze and Guattari, in the Thousand Plateaus, which, which Allier and, and La Strato follow, since World War I, the, the true nature of war has been revealed uh, as the war machine that it truly is. And, uh, what, what, what was it that was revealed in, in the mechanization and the creation of the industrial military complex um, uh, is the following, that, that, that even though the state, as understood uh, you know, as a political entity, aspires to some, some kind of order or stability or uniformity, doesn't really want to be at war, capitalism nevertheless uh, profits directly from and is in in fact, interested in perpetuating uh, total war, not not necessarily and always an, an overt uh, armed conflict, but a much more insidious kind of war against populations, which is what Matt was referring to uh, with his uh, reference to the control society. Um, and this is very much what financialization is is all about. And I think we're we're starting to understand this more and more that that. Financialization is, is really about surveillance and control. It's really not about profit. This is very important to understand because the, the smart currencies, the blockchain ledger, and so on are, are already being rolled out um, by people like Jeff Bezos to weaponize you know, early childhood education, to uh, make poverty something that can be the sub sort of subject of direct investment. To, this, is, this is sort of the frontier here. But the basic idea is that financialization, which is the one way of thinking about the neoliberal era, We've been in is it's all about indexing and pricing and making it possible to speculate on, on differentials. And thanks to derivatives, finance can profit as much from destruction as from creation, as much from depreciation as appreciation. All capital needs is a market. All it needs is some contingency or, or, or some chance, as I, I wrote about in my last book. So in order to in order to create enough volatility for there to be speculation, we want to destabilize the earth, we want to destabilize social life. We want to undermine any and all ways of human solidarity um, to make people dependent on uh, the powers that be. Uh, and this is exactly what Allier and Lostrato called the situation of total civil war, of, or the war of the population, so war within populations. Uh, thank you. Yeah, and th this goes by other names, bio and necropower, quantification and, and tokenization of any and all human differentiations. Uh, as, a, as a site of speculation. And um, uh, this, in fact, becomes what is known as peace. A peaceful situation in our era is a situation in which capitalism is able to run its program of war on the populations unimpeded in an unrestricted way. That is, that is peace, and therefore it's worth calling that an, an a monstrous and violent situation for precisely because it, it disables the one conflict we need to have, which is the conflict with the capitalist extraction machine itself. 
So I, I think it's important to frame our situation in that way because it helps us understand also why uh, so many of our social movements that, that seem so promising, whether it's Occupy or Standing Rock or whatever, hit these incredibly powerful walls that are walls of, of exhaustion, uh, walls of, of um, uh, uh, physical danger, obviously the repressions of police state apparatus like we were talking about uh, in, with Oakland Occupy yesterday. But um, we really need to understand uh, uh, the, the, the challenge in, in terms of how to be at war, and that because I think that affects what kind of pedagogy we need uh, uh, at this point. Um, so it, this, this leads to the second half of, of my remarks, and I'll condense this a little bit for the interest of time. Um, this comes to how we can learn to to die, how we can learn to be, as it were, you know, willing to die. What would it mean? Um, because, in a way, if if one fit one of the failures of '68 was to trade a false peace for over a war, the other failure might be characterized as, as the willingness to trade death for a false life. And this this relates directly to the affluent society. You know that, that you know the, the problem with the affluent society is not is not that it's not pleasurable or comfortable. That is the problem with it, right? So we need to learn how to be in discomfort, in a kind of radical discomfort. Um, and that's, that's what I'm talking about here. So, um, and, and this is where I want to turn to um, the, the educational theorist, Vanessa Andriotti, uh, who's at the University of British Columbia. Um, uh, is anybody familiar with her work? Um, I, can, I can't recommend her highly enough. Um, and and um, uh, she talks about the fact that what we, I'm gonna, I'm gonna read a little bit of words from her because she's there's a really great language around this, but she basically says that we need to learn to live outside what she calls the house. And the house is, is this structure that protects us from the very world that we need communion with, need to learn from, need to learn with, uh, to go back to the whitehead point. And the house is built by four walls. One wall is capitalism, one wall is a nation state, one wall is a, a single universal conception of rationality, and another wall is the presumed separability between uh, individual human beings and either other human beings or other species or you know, the cosmos itself. So those are the four walls. I heard they all need to go, uh, but she works <laughs> with, uh, and burn the whole house down, but she, but she works with communities, mainly in Latin America, who are, are trying to do without at least three of the four walls. Um, so that's where her work is sort of coming from. And the struggle of that is something she describes in a recent interview with um, Rob Hopkins, um, it's a, a podcast, I can, I can give you the reference for this. So here's what she said. I'm just going to read this quote from her and then summarize the kind of bullet points, what I think the takeaways are, and then uh, that'll be it for me. And this is Vanessa. This is, these are her words. In many ways, our struggle can be compared to an addiction process where we get dopamine, serotonin, and oxytocin in certain ways. And of course, there are infinite possibilities in different configurations, but this, this one, the house, uh, which, you just, which we described, is just the most available one. And what would it take for us to choose to be in withdrawal? What would it take for us to choose to be in withdrawal? To try different things. This is part of what we're asking uh, in, in, through the collectives that she works with. We don't have the stamina. We don't have the stamina to sit with our denials, our foreclosures, and the difficult things without falling apart internally or without having our relationships fall apart, we can't even start the process because we will keep on defending and protecting our own fragility in doing this. And, and that's the fragility of the affluent society, you can say, anyway. Um, because if you go deep into the, violence of the violences of the past, you can get caught in a vortex of guilt and blame and worthlessness and lack of belonging. This is not useful. There, that's, there's an existential surrender necessary here that's in excess of our knowing, existential surrender. Then on the other side, to bring, uh, she's talking about bringing the new worlds into being, you need similar things that are different, but that are similar but different. Instead of intellectual accountability, which is what we need to be honest about what's happened before, we need a kind of existential accountability, uh, but not as an intellectual choice. It's already something that neurologically we're prone to doing if we can, if we can find it. But we also need intellectual surrender, 
uh, again, this is, these are her words, the best way I think we can talk about it is allowing the land to dream through you. Allowing the land to dream through you. So allowing the imagination to open to the collective entanglement with things and not thinking it's an individual task. It is something that comes through you. Indigenous people would say it's through your ancestors, but the ancestors are not only human, and they are not only those who have come before, it's me and you. Uh, but what I'm talking about is me in you, me in you. Me in this bigger metabolism where I'm just part of something that was born and dies every day, a continuous cycle of regeneration. But right now, we are probably stuck somewhere in this cycle and sick, and, and trying to heal ourselves. How do I allow this sickness to pass through me without being afraid of dying or afraid of the pain in this process? Because it's painful already. It's just that the effort that it takes for us to placate the pain is preventing us from doing other things that we can do with pain in terms of opening up other possibilities. I think that's a really important point. I'm gonna read it again. Say, the effort that it takes for us to placate the pain is preventing us from doing other things that we can do with pain in terms of opening up other possibilities. How do we go for the seeds, rather than looking for our own sense of worth and belonging and value in the thing that we're doing? That kind of thinking, I found, I, Vanessa, of, of that kind of sensing, sensing actually, is not thinking it comes from the gut. It's a visceral thing uh, about us being, uh, that those, that us being those who, who, who will come after us, that those who come after us are still us. And my body has a different temporality that spans lifetimes, and I take into account of that as I'm doing something, and I have more patience to learn from my mistakes so that others can make different ones, not the same one. Uh, and so this sense of worthlessness, fear of worthlessness, of pointlessness, of meaninglessness uh, tends to drive our efforts, but uh, uh, we need to get over this problem of separability, the separation of humans from everyone else in order to confront this, because it's created this idea that we don't have intrinsic value. And what if we remain, remove that fear, that pointlessness, and what would it then be possible for us to do? So those are some of Vanessa's words. Again, I, I, I can't recommend her highly enough. So just quickly, um, what what's the pedagogy on offer here? Well, one, these are, these are things that I would try to tell my students. I think we should all try to tell ourselves. One, you are not your identity, or your identity is not you. You are your ancestors. Your ancestors are you. The ancestors are partly in the past and partly in the future. Some of them are human, most of them are not. Two, you are not the mushroom, you're the mycelium. You are not the actualization, you are the repotentiation. You are not the fruit, you are the seed carrier. Three, you are helping things die as much as bringing things into birth. You are performing hospice as much as midwifery. We need to deal publicly with bitterness, rage, and grief. We need more public grief and more well-informed and healing expressions of rage. I think this is part of what it is to be at war. Four, disillusionment is good. It means you are relinquishing illusions. Be very careful not to individually pathologize depression, anxiety, and lack of attention span. This could be because the house is not worth living in. Five, we cannot imagine a post-capitalist future using our intellect. It has to come from our gut, from our sensorium, from a very different way of feeling in the world, a way that is not assisted by our habitual modes of getting oxytocin, serotonin, and dopamine. We cannot and will not change how we think it is possible to live or who it is possible to love unless we change what we can feel good at bonding with and what kind of discomfort we can endure and learn to thrive in. Six, it's not enough to inspire people with new ideas and new visions. The problem we face is not how to model or scale or think or even imagine differently. It's a problem of deep attrition at the level of our sensorium. It's a, it's a kind of exhaustion. We've been at war. War has been waged on us for the last 40 years. The evacuation of the welfare state, the destruction of the natural environment, the decimation of modes of human solidarity and interaction that are not monetized. These are wars against our sensorium. These are wars against our ability to feel through discomfort with others into something new. Seven, last point. This brings us to the darkest and hardest thing, which is that most of us will not see the fruits of this fight even if we decide to engage it. We may assist in the mulching and composition of the mycelium, 
but we will not live to see or even be the mushrooms. This means for us, and maybe this is what we have to teach, that having meaning and purpose may not be the essence of human life, at least not of our individual lives in a way that we will see or possess in our lifetimes. Last paragraph. As Andy already points out in the interview, the, the, the idea that human life or human life worth living is a life of meaning and purpose is actually a historical construct. It has a genealogy. It may arguably, arguably be a white, colonizing, and sexist construct. And her point here should be fairly obvious to any observer. When, when we think about how we talk, when we say, go find your purpose, it sounds like the hero's quest, or the adventure, or the colonial expedition, or the entrepreneurial self, or the capitalist enterprise. In some ways, even, even ancient initiatory or ordeals are problematic from this perspective because they tend to involve a confrontation with the Earth, usually a female Mother Earth, that has to be dominated or tamed or even destroyed in order for order and meaning and purpose to come into human society, in order for the state to emerge, the kingdom, the peace. Um, now, this is not to argue that there's no such thing as meaning or purpose in some sense. But meaningful for what or for whom? Even thinking about the earth itself, who lavishly gives and sacrificially gives even, cares for each of us radically abundantly as we continue to insist on our exciting processes of self-discovery. The, the idea that a life or a life well lived is a purposeful life needs to be radically interrogated. In order to have or possess such a life, one has to have a context in which such, such a life is validated and seen and honored and supported by others. And there has been no Western society, maybe no society, in which it is not abundantly clear that meaningful life is for certain people with certain endowments to attain or fail to attain, and everyone else is there to support them. For some to have meaningful lives, for some to feel sovereign, there must be hierarchy, there must be sacrifice, there must be blood. Whether this is the role of slaves and women in the ancient Greek polis, or the role of colonized or dispossessed peoples, or the poor, the indebted, the racialized, gendered, uh, in, in the contemporary world, even of animals and plants itself, of the earth itself, uh, there are entities who by definition cannot have meaningful and purpose purposive lives so that others can. If what I'm saying is even remotely true, if there is this much blood on the hands of meaning, why in this case do we need to keep worrying about trying to instill in people a sense of meaning and purpose? Like the crime of founding a new bank compared to burning one down, what is the crime of feeling despair compared with the crime of finding a meaningful, purposeful, happy existence in a world constituted by total capitalist war? But this is not to despair. What we have to teach is the sense of the body as being transtemporal. And this is primarily experiential. And it's where the war is. That's where the struggle is. And it's not a struggle that the disabled, the young, or the most vulnerable are able to engage. They're already under too much pressure. They're too threatened. It must be done by those who can, until others can, while we still can. And we can only do it together. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Joshua. Water talk. <laughs> very radical and very beautiful. Uh, I think uh, we have half an hour and uh, we can spend a little time conversing among ourselves. Because I think there was a lot of synergy, a lot of parallels in what was discussed. And <clears throat> if I'm to draw a central thread out, I think that there are many threads of connection. And we can probably explore that a little bit and then throw it open to the public, uh, to the audience. Uh, <clears throat> you know, Nietzsche has talked about the last man. The fact that uh, sometimes it's really the kind of anodyne of satisfaction that kills us, that kills us, that, that kills the humanity within, uh, that the fire dies inside us. And, and on the other hand, you have this continuous war that's, that's going on. So with, between the two, on the one hand, the kind of uh, slaying of welfare and the other hand, the uh, sort of continuous uh, degradation of, of our life through our instrumentation. We are becoming instruments of the war uh, apparatus. Uh, I, I think we are losing our discontent. This is exactly what's happening. And pedagogy is just an instrument in that, in that process. 
So I think uh, these were some of the uh, key notions uh, that we need to recover. And in our pedagogy, I, I believe that, I think apart from the fact of a more holistic understanding of pedagogy, where it isn't just mental understanding, but a visceral understanding, a physical understanding, and a deep understanding, an emotional understanding, uh, that we need to recover these things. Uh, Sri Aurobindo would have called it aspiration. And I think uh, one of the things that I really, uh, beautiful uh, quotations that uh, Joshua gave was this one about uh, existential surrender in excess of our knowing. Uh, I think this existential surrender in excess of our knowing, which goes beyond uh, our capacity to actually put a label on where we are going, uh, but which is also, in a way, the preparation for death, as you called it, you see, that, that existential surrender in excess of our knowing. Uh, so I, I take these away as points of uh, synergy between the three talks, and I'd like to uh, open up a discussion between us, and uh, if uh, any of you would like to comment more on this and take it further. I'll offer uh, something. Thank you, Devashish. Um, you know, in listening to Joshua uh, and Jake, I was thinking about in the context of education, we can explore the extent to which the human is, human capacities, human nature is plastic versus fixed. And um, certainly the whole point of education is that we're not fixed. And I think about in the political arena since the French Revolution, how we've fallen into these, this dichotomy of left versus right or progressive versus conservative. And at the current time, you know, psychologists and neuroscientists are even, um, uh, they're doing research and producing knowledge, which is suggesting that this left-right dichotomy is folded into the very folds of our brain, right? Making it seem like we're stuck here in this dichotomy. And I don't know about you guys, but I'm increasingly sick and tired of that um, way of framing the struggle. It's not, these aren't adequate concepts anymore. Maybe left, right was adequate in um, a disciplinary society more so than it is now in a control society when power isn't held in institutions in the way that it was, with, it, with power now being more um, decentralized, which isn't to say that it's not um, hegemonic, it seems like we need a new way of thinking about politics that isn't broken into this dichotomy, and yet we're constantly having it reinforced, even by scientists telling us that this is just human nature. Some of us are conservative, some of us are progressive, and it has to do with our biology, and maybe at best with our development, but once we're in those, on one side or the other, we're kind of locked in. And I don't think that's true. But how do we break out of that? It's a question that I've had. I think Josh, you need to turn the on button on. This is, Matt, this just occurred to me while you're speaking that maybe I'm hesitant about this. Um, I want to just offer this as something to maybe take up, but I mean, we might we might want to take up the the idea that um, maybe not being right or left or being conservative versus liberal, but but becoming becoming rightish or leftist or leftist or becoming conservative or liberal has has something to do has a lot to do with, um, you know, the way people experience things like anxiety or fear. Um, you know, there's a lot of research trying to reduce political positioning to, to affect, you know, to how you're feeling. I mean, I think I, I think there's some, something in that needs to be taken on, on board, I think. I think that if, if I'm being honest about the direction my presentation is pointing, because it is a kind of gut level, you know, there's some, I think there's something to be taken up 
there. I, I think that the determinism and the, the you're resisting is, is right to resist. You know, it's, oh, oh, well, we're, you know, pre-programmed in some sense to, to be right or left. No, I mean, I think we're, it depends on our experiences, right, and how those can be um, uh, rem remediated or, or healed in some way. But, um, yeah, I mean, that's, I, what, what I'm, what's behind that is, well, behind that is, is, is the concern I'm, I'm sure everyone shares in here that discourse and, and, and discursivity has become impossible. I mean, we're in this, in this situation of, you know, um, yeah, news speak from, you know, from what Brave, Brave New World or 1984, I always forget which one that is. But um, yeah, I mean, we're in this crazy, we're in this crazy zone where, yeah, the, the, it, it, everything that happens on the, in the media and on social media is this sort of hallucination, you know, and how do you, I mean, we feel, I feel, I feel like so uh, unmotivated to engage people right now at the level of the signs they admit, you know, at the level of the, you know, the signals they're sending or the level of the, um, the discourse they think they're participating in. Because, I mean, if I'm honest about myself, like I'm not just pointing a finger at other people. If I'm honest about myself, like I, I don't know how to articulate what I need right now or what I want right now. Like, so what, do I want someone to engage with me at, at the level of what I think I think? <laughs> Which is sort of the, 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 the simulation of knowledge or the simulation of information, right, that's being generated by us posting all the time and by, or by, you know, the positionality of the, anyway, we, you, we all know this problem, you don't need me to describe it, but I'm thinking mainly, my thought was that mainly, maybe in this context, it actually, it, it might be worth shifting to something like a, a more experiential or affect-based or some other kind of approach, you know, to, to being with others, to being with with people we're unfamiliar with or whatever. I mean, that, that was just what your remark uh, set me off. Do you have any thoughts about this? I think um, the, the reification of two political directions as exhaustive of the way in which we can comport ourselves to questions of common pursuit and shared life has become so destructive for our capacity to imagine and construct new social communities uh, that I'm totally with you on wanting to find a way out of that. I think in one sense, you know, Joshua mentioned some of the ways in which exhaustion and uh, the, the kind of, um, the, just the, the failure of even, even those movements that seem to promise the most uh, is written in, and I think part of the way it's written in is by this reification of just two binary options as describing the manifold capacities of human life and sociality. I mean, it's just, it's just crazy, like, when you think about it, that it would be reduced to, as if the law of the excluded middle pertained to uh, imaginative creation as opposed to logical operations. And that's, uh, and precisely, it, what it precisely does, I think, is, is what Joshua was getting at in his description of uh, financialization as profiting off of a, a kind of, yeah, as, as, as a kind of Hobbesian state of, of the war of all against all, uh, which is all you can have if you're, if you're struck in this sort of, stuck in this sort of binary opposition. I mean, just even at a metaphysical level, people have been thinking about this for two and a half thousand years. Of, you know, the second needs a third in order to mediate uh, and to generate, right? It's, it's with the addition of a third, you know this from Schelling, uh, that the replete generative capacities of life uh, become available uh, and you're stuck in a kind of uh, inescapable ontology of war uh, yeah. and not the kind of war that Joshua was describing as the noble refusal uh, to be interpolated by the present system. But, yeah, exactly. 
exactly. Right. And I, part of my own struggle has been to find this mediating potential without it becoming um, what gets called, called centrism. Um, because that seems to me to be an example of saying comfort, capitalism is one, let's just relax and you know we can have our political skirmishes about left and right, but at the end of the day, we know what the right political system is, we know what the right economic system is, let's just relax. We can't relax. So the mediating third possibility between the extreme on either side is not, I don't want to be misunderstood as suggesting we need all to become centrists. No. Um, but I, I get, the struggle for me is, you know, I get that, um, you know, as you were describing, Jake, this, in the modern period, this push to, after the world wars especially, like, okay, everything we've been doing is wrong, we need to totally detach, cut ourselves off from the past and create it from scratch, create something new from scratch. That seems dangerous to me because history is what forms us. And so in some sense, I'm like, yeah, let's, we need to be able to move forward conserving our history, conserving what, what we've learned from the past, while also recognizing the many um, injustices of the past and the many forms of inequality um, that need to be overcome. But for me, the question, as someone who's generally progressive and, and left-leaning is like, how do we get to where we want to get to from here? And we can't just pretend like, you know, the end justifies the means. The means is absolutely essential. So how do we have a more just, equal society? Is war necessary? And I, I maybe it is, a sort of civil war, a revolutionary war. But there's a lot of cost that comes with that. And the, trying to weigh the scale of how much killing is worth it in order to get to this end that seems utopian, um, that seems like part of what the 20th century was, was about, this search for, a, especially with the, the Soviet Union and whatnot. Um, so yeah, I'm struggling with this in myself. So if, if I may say something, I think um, <clears throat> Jake, you brought up the issue of uh, the degradation of the left in Del Noche and the idea of the loss of the messianic, uh, the loss of uh, kind of a, a, an excess of idealism, if, if, if I may use that term. And I, I think that's the basis of the subjective root of the war. Mm. I think rekindling that is, is really the war because that leads to what the, otherwise we think of war in an instrumental way as well, just as we are thinking of the left and right in an instrumental way. It's really the capital system that both left and right are serving once they've lost their messianism, right? Uh, and w would you like to say something about that, Jake, particularly about the yeah, no, Del I mean, notion? Well, so Del Noche's reading, I think, is, is it's, it's more particular to Europe than it is to, to North America. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, so what he calls the decomposition of Marxism was more apparent there than it was for us over here. In one sense, we didn't have to go through the decomposition of Marxism to end up at that sure. same utilitarian values of, yeah. the, of the affluent society because it was, it was germinating throughout the 19th century. Right. Yeah. 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 Uh, but what he was particularly interested in was way um, the way that Marxist, I mean, on my reading, Marx is basically a romantic theorist, uh, and uh, and that the, the messianic aspects of Marx's thought uh, sort of redeploy in a kind of Feuerbachian atheist mode uh, many of the revolutionary uh, religious impulses of the Abrahamic tradition, right? Um, and Walter Benjamin is, I think, sure. the great example of this in the early 20th century. Uh, what, what Del Noche thought he was witnessing was the way in which that romantic side of the Marxian movements of the 20th century had disappeared, uh, really under bureaucratization and 
these totalitarian impulses because you can only su you can only sustain that romantic messianic hope if there's a place for culture outside of politics understood only in terms of uh, bureaucracy and instrument right it's it's Marx has that deeply cultural sense to him in which the whole point of revolution is so that we can enjoy cultural goods it's not uh, it's not revolution just in and of itself uh, but once once everything is indexed instrumentally back to uh, technological production, then there is no place for messianic hope. And I think part of what I took from Joshua's really, um, really moving invocations, uh, especially about the sort of the invocations at the end about uh, allowing the ancestors to to dream through us and the earth, the land to dream through us, uh, and which is really about collective identity, that's, that's achieved. The openness for that space, the porosity right. to that, to right. those movements is in a space that's outside of this in instrumental plane. And, and the difficulty we have is to craft a space in which that even becomes possible. Like you said, we're, we're, we're just assaulted, we're besieged by the, the constant effort to turn everything immediately into an instrumental means. Uh, and uh, and one thing that I think that you know radical pedagogy or just pedagogy in general in the classical sense can do is to make that space in which I I I and not just me but I and my community the the whole of us get together in order to to do that collectively at a somatic psychological and intellectual level. Yeah. Yeah. Can I just follow up really quick? Yeah, please, I'm please. really, I'm really uh, eager to hear what other folks have sure. to say. I just want to be really, really quick on this. That um, the couple things um, coming up for me. One is that the, I'm going to put my sort of anarcho-Marxist cards on the table here because I, the way I tend to think about the question of revolution and utopian hope, which I think are really important, is that. It, Capitalism is the system that prevents us from acting on what we already know we need and desire to be together. So I don't, I don't think in terms of, okay, kids, let's imagine a different world. It's, it's, let's imagine the world in which capitalism is no longer preventing us from realizing the world that we all know we want and need. I mean, this is very much in the spirit of the early Marx who you know, I agree with you. He, he, you know, ultimately, Marx's conception of the human is, is as a passionate creature, which means it's driven by imagination, ultimately, in this kind of ecstatic relationship with the world that draws us outside ourselves. And, you know, this is later kind of scientific Marxist views that only read capital. You know, they're leaving out really crucial elements in Marx's humanism, basically. So I, I totally agree. But um, in, in terms of the, in terms of the, the project of whatever you want to call it, building the future, um, uh, imagining the future. I mean, for me, I would say in the last four or five years, especially, but really all my life, that the, the, it is absolutely crucial that we sit at the feet of indigenous peoples and marginalized and oppressed peoples uh, all over the world because they are the ones who have continued to survive and live human lives, you know, while being at war, <laughs> in the sense that I, I've been talking about. This is what I experienced firsthand at Standing Rock. You know, we, we were there in ceremony, people were being healed, people were expressing themselves, there was joy and abundance of food, abundance of culture, abundance of connection, while we were at war. While we, while we were maintaining, you know, as best we could, the the uh, the struggle uh, to protect the water, right? So, I mean, it's very important to me as as a white person, as you know, someone who comes from you know white, you know, lower middle class anyway society that 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 you know um, you know we uh, in my my own case, I, I I'm involved now very deeply in studying. In particular, Afro-Caribbean struggles and 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 the, the decolonial uh, movements coming out of Latin American thinkers and Afro-diasporic thinkers in particular, um, 
because there's the, the, the reason as it relates to this conversation, I, I think that it's very, very, very easy for uh, white folks in particular, but, but by white I mean a kind of culture of whiteness that's built around a kind of European way of thinking about progress and development that's rooted in, 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 in imperialism and extraction and colonialism. It's very easy for us to think that the future is something that we have to build, right, and, and make, and this is again my problem with meaning and purpose is that we're, our model for the meaningful life is, is, yeah, this kind of, you know, someone does the, what's that? Project. Yeah, and, and, someone, and someone assists you in that project, so, you know, whether it's the earth itself or other people, so that, so that there can be these heroes, these exemplars, and these, you know, and I think that, that model is very pernicious, and it's even in our psyches, you know, we're trying to achieve psychic health on the basis of, you know, subordinating or suppressing or hacking you know, our consciousness in some other way. So this is, I'm putting this out there as a problem. I don't, I have so much work to do in myself on this. I think we all do. But I think we need to be indigenous-led and led by, by marginalized and oppressed peoples uh, because I think that's, they're the ones that are carrying the wisdom uh, on this. And I want to acknowledge that because I, my own thinking is totally indebted uh, to them and my, my own living is too. I think we, we all uh, need to acknowledge that. So. Can, can we yeah. get some? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Joshua, or, thank you for reminding me that today is the uh, feast day of my patron archangel. Right. My name is Michael. Oh, great. <laughs> so, it, it, I was wondering in myself, as I was listening to you, why am I resisting this message? Mm -hmm. and, you, and it came at the end. And, and I'll tell you a bit about that. At the end, you said most of us will not see the fruits of the fight if we decide to engage in it. And, and I was thinking, I have considerable resources now, considerable resources and skills and abilities and financial resources, which I've gained through the market system. And I know about Michael's sword, so I'm thinking, if I take up that sword, Will I be like somebody who in 1917 is sitting with Lenin, Trotsky, and Stalin, willing to take up the sword, but not really realizing that Stalin was going to prevail? Mm -hmm. Or would I be like on, on the Great March with Cho and Lai and Mao Zedong, not realizing that my affinities are with Cho and Lai, mm -hmm. that he was not going to prevail? I'm not against using my resources to take up that sword, but the fruits are so unclear mm -hmm. that until they become much clearer to me, mm -hmm. I'm not. I'm just at my stage in life, not willing to take the chance. Well, I mean, I really appreciate your your honesty. It's an incredible, um, uh, you know, uh, gesture. Thank you. Um, I mean. I want to hear what other people say about this too. I don't want to claim to have any real higher wisdom here. I mean, my immediate response is, um, uh, I, I think the answer probably has something to do with Andreotti's line about allowing the earth to dream through us, because I think, I think there is more uncertainty in in, in outcomes than most of us want to live with or are willing to live with. But I also don't think that means it's, uh, you know, completely um, unguided or un unmediated. I think it, it needs to happen in community. You know, I mean, I would, just practically speaking, you know, my advice to you or any of us would be get with as many people as you can trust. Don't try to make these decisions alone, right? And then, and then use your judgment, you know, to, you know, allow you <laughs> allow your resources to flow, you know, in where you think they're going to be most effective. But because I, I just, I mean, the future is radically uncertain. You know, what what I, what I don't like about, I mean, it's easier to talk about what we don't like. <laughs> like you know, and I, I don't, what I don't like about you know what Jeff Bezos wants to do is he he wants to control outcomes of you know or, or something like early childhood education as that's a definitely guarantee he wants. He won't invest unless he knows he can. He's going to see, you know, and I think, I think we have to. 
I just, I, I think that we, we have to trust, we have to radically trust, even beyond, you know, uh, our imagination. Um, uh, and I think this is part of the kind of insidious justification for the way we treat the, the, the poor in general. We, we say, well, you know, I'm willing to help you if you'll tell me how you're going to behave, you know? And I just, I mean, at some point, I just think that's wrong. I think that, that, that what, like what Deleuze said is really true. The, the, the poor don't need to be asked what they want. They need to be left alone so that what they need is no longer prevented from them, you know, prevented from reaching them. I mean, I think that's what, where our resources go, I think. This is, and I want to hear whether it should be in standing down from the extractive machines that make the poor dependent in the first place. It's not, it's not about going in and finding out what poor communities, what programs they need in order to survive their ongoing extraction. It's about standing down from extraction, which is, you know, that's, that's revolutionary. What happens after that, I don't think we can guarantee or, or we know, but the, like I was saying earlier, I guess I am a kind of radical humanist in the way that Marx was. And I, I think that human beings have all kinds of tendencies. Um, some are good and some, some are bad, but I don't think we can engineer the future. I think we have to stand down from the forces that prevent us from experimenting with what the future might be. And I would like to see resources going that way, but that, that's, I mean, I don't know how much that helps, but I want to hear what other people have to say. Um, thank you again, guys. That was really, all of you, really, really good, very amazing. Um, but I'm wondering, I just offer this as a comment. I'm not an academic, I'm not an intellectual, but I'm just offering this as a critique, uh, I was surprised by the definition of meaning. And I'm wondering if we're all already colonized by this objective industrial consciousness. Why are we looking at meaning as a noun? Why are we looking at just equitable society as a unit to be achieved? What if meaning is a process? What if meaning is in this intersubjective dialogue? Meaning is what I live by. It's not the answer to a riddle. And also, um, I'm sorry, I'm a bit emotional because for many, many reasons, having come out from what's considered in the West as an indigenous society, uh, Indian middle class, being a woman and having and knowing the drawbacks of that society. Man, there are injustices throughout. If I'd stayed all my life in India, I would be I would consider myself being oppressed by male patriarchy. I would not be standing here and trying to dialogue with you guys. So I'm looking, for, and, but I agree with you, Matt, that we should be looking at, uh, there is a historical arc or dimension to it, an evolutionary process that's happening to society. I don't think we can posit what the future is, uh, but we can just be open to let the future breathe through us or something like that. Sorry. Yeah. Anyway. I hope that made some sense, and I'd love to hear some comments back. I mean, just on your, your comment about meaning, why do we conceive of it as a noun, something that we would find and possess, but that it's more of an ongoing process? I mean, that's kind of what my title is pointing to, from final knowledge to infinite learning. Yeah. Um, and meaning is always discovered again anew with each encounter um, that we have. And it's, it's not individual, nor is it simply communal either, because there can be communal social meanings that are oppressive. And then the meaning, the search for meaning becomes, well, how do I break out of that? So it's this dialectical tension between inside and us together. Um,
really appreciate your comment, and it made me think of, um, I think all of us abridged what we, it made us, I think all of us probably abridged some of what we were hoping to say this morning. Uh, one of the things I really appreciate about uh, where Barfield ends this essay that I was talking about a little bit is he ends with the thing that he calls the coming trauma of materialism is what happens, suppose, supposing this uh, affluent society, whatever you want to call it, what happens supposing it does crumble? Uh, and that's where the pedagogical role, Barfield thinks especially of the humanities, is so important. Because it's not, uh, while I have some sympathies with, with Joshua's anarcho-Marxist notion that our, that you know, left to our own, we meet our, we have desires and needs that we will collectively organize around. Um, there, and I, I'm sure I'm not, I'm sure you, you would probably hold to this too. I shouldn't speak for you, that's a terrible thing to do. But, uh, <laughs> not necessarily, not sufficient for politics, but it's... Yeah, so yeah, Barfield's point is not that we need to uh, imagine okay. our way into the future, but that we need to prepare the conversations uh, collectively and uh, consciously, reflexively, about our ends and our desires and the good, the true and the beautiful and so forth, that we need to prepare the space for them by, by engaging in those conversations now. Because what happens, suppose this structure collapses, it's just as easy to imagine uh, an even more oppressive uh, form of mobilization emerging. And that's where I think these sort of, uh, these exercises in, uh, you know, these exercises in the collective imagination, not necessarily indexed to the future, but just yeah. exercises in the collective imagination of how we can be together uh, powerfully and stably. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think I'll really quickly follow up on that. This relates to what I was, the point I was trying to make about in indigenous struggles, indigenous folks. I, if, I do not in any way mean to romanticize the past or, or romanticize or orientalize on indigenous societies. What I mean is that in, in those places where indigenous communities have been in struggle for their survival, um, they, this action you're talking about is not an exercise in imagination for them, it's an exercise in survival. So this, this, that's what I'm saying it is very important to learn from. So I'm thinking about the fact that you know, when you say something like, well, what if this material order collapses, then what's next? We need to remember that this material order is a collapse for most people who have been living it for most of the time outside of a very, very small window of, of folks like us who have uh, tremendous resources. What about that, right? So this that's kind of, uh, and this is very much the edge of my own thought. So, I mean, I'm not saying don't engage the imagination and experimentation, but also, you know, imagine that <laughs> actual, say, black urban communities have managed to survive in the way that they have under the incredible conditions of degradation that they have, right? And let's find out what wisdom is in that, you know, or what wisdom is in other other kinds of survival like this. And again, this is this is a suggestion. It's not it's not an opposition to what you're saying, but it, that, that was where my invocation of indigeneity is coming from. And the other point to clarify really quickly is you're absolutely right. The, the way I was using the terms meaning and purpose were very, very pointed in my talk. I'm not trying to create, uh, I'm not making a statement about the essence of meaningfulness or the essence of purpose in like a philosophical sense. I'm, I'm engaging in imminent critique with the fact that the way those signs are used in this context, which is the, the war of capital, is all about all the neoliberal ethics, like leaning in, you know, hacking your life, doing all the things you do to survive the person working, you know, in San Francisco, like that, that's, like that, that's, so you're right, I mean, I'm being very, very pointed in, in my use of that term, because I agree with Matt completely, and I think I agree with you, that meaning is process, that, you know, we can talk about this very differently, but I think it's very important to stay at that edge, because human beings never just get to use words in an ideal or idealizing context, we're always in a, in a situated historical situation in which those, those signs are, are indexed to different forms of life. Um, I just wanted to make that clear. Yeah. Yeah, I am not an intellectual also. I am not part of this house, but uh, I will take the risk to uh, 
in the conversation a little bit more about Mike's comment about. I will take the risk to comment about Mike's comment about the risks to, to the uncertainty, because uh, Matt Matt says something that kind of stuck me about learning. You said learning will become something else, and it's an infinite task. So I am learning a lot about Christine for taking the risk to put all the resources out and to take the risk to produce some change. She doesn't know how it's coming after. She didn't know uh, about the parents or whatever will happen, but she took the risk. She was in peace, a professor well known, but she took the risk and put all the resources outside. So I think we we can learn every day from these people and take the risk. And when I became, came to this country as a migrant, it's a risk every day. Yeah, it's a risk to be here. And being a woman is a double risk. Uh, being uh, uh, with this color is another risk, and so on. So we cannot divide the minorities, minorities or whatever is the word between women, refugees, and that. It's a refugee, and plus a woman, and plus this, and plus this, plus this. So I think it's important to remember that we are a unity, and we can expand our consciousness. I think it's part of our t task here to expand the hearts, as someone says, thinking that also. And expand our consciousness. I think it's, it's worth the risk, no? This, it's, it's, on. On. it's on. Okay, uh, this is more of a observation, um, because when you started, uh, Joshua, when you started and you had trouble saying that biblical phrase, <laughs> uh, that was helpful, because since that time there have been a couple more comments that seem to, I'm just put out there, misunderstand your use of the word war. Uh, you know, with Mike's comment of, I don't know what I'm signing up for, it could be telling lies, not going to make it, or yeah. I think if and Matt, you said something about understanding. So I think for me, it's such a radical concept that you're stating that I think it's, it's just going to, for me, it's just going to take time to assimilate. Yeah. Um, what, you're, what you mean is, I think it's appropriate you, you're using the word struggle and the discomfort because it, when, you know, the dichotomy of these words of war and peace just uh, catapults you into opposition to even taking in what you're saying. So I just want to give you that feedback. Well, first of all, thank you, right, for bringing letting us have a different look at all of those words and what they mean. But I think the feedback is that you're, for me, I'm, I have to do some assimilation, but I want to thank you. <laughs> well, so do, so do I. So. <laughs> um, I know we're at, yeah. yeah. Just Last to briefly say, you know, um, Joshua, you were saying that consciousness is so important, but it's not enough. You know, material conditions being transformed so that, as Marx said, you know, to each according to his need, from each according to his or her ability. Um, like, both of these perspectives are so important, but given where we are right now and the amount of violence that would be required, at least in an interim period, in order to achieve a, a equality of material conditions, given the power structures in place, it seems to me to move forward, what we need is this consciousness of connection across differences so that we can mobilize together against the capitalist war machine without being broken up into these ever vanishingly small um, differences and identities. And I love what you said, Joshua, about um, you are not an identity, you are your ancestors. Um, because when you go back far enough, <laughs> we all share the same ancestors. 
Um, so just a little plug for maybe a new kind of consciousness here to help us forward. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. I think uh, we are at the end of our panel, and it's time for lunch. So thanks. I won't. Thank you.